Good morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome to uh, Canada Business Live. This is our 40th episode. Wow, four zero. Crazy. Amazing. I'm Craig Arnoff. Travis Copenhaver. Yes, from Cannabis Legal Group. Uh, we're attorneys uh, in Michigan, and we focus on Michigan's Medical Marijuana Facility Licensing Act. Medical Marijuana Act and uh, all things to do with new medical cannabis laws here in Michigan. Um, we are coming to you from Royal Oak, Michigan. Um, we're going to be talking today on a topic called uh, municipal applications. But before we do, I want to remind you to check out our map page. It's uh, on here on the screen, CannabisLegalGroup.com Municipalities. Visit our YouTube uh, site to see our past videos and, um, you know, interact with us. So like us, share us, ask questions throughout today's show or after, and we'll do our best to answer those for you. And, uh, of course, be as responsive as we can. Uh, certainly if uh, our microphone, we kind of put ourselves in another uh, conference room today, so if, there, if our microphone is in any way not picking this up, please let us know, because uh, as far as we can tell, it's perfectly sound. So, <laughs> um, you know, uh, Travis, you and I were talking in advance of today's show, and, you know, just municipalities as a whole. And so, you know, we've done a good job, I think, of talking about where to find locations. But what happens when you do? Why don't we just give us some? Yeah, advice? so, you know, obviously getting the location is very important, but now you have to file an application to get that permission to actually pursue one of these licenses. And that's what we're going to focus in on today. Um, I think the big takeaway, if, if you get nothing else from this, is every community sets its own rules. So an application in one municipality is going to potentially look completely different than an application you prepare for a different one. Um, there are a lot of similarities. There are a lot of items that you probably are going to use in any application. Um, but what those different narratives and plans need to convey, um, what details you need to provide that municipality uh, so that they can approve you or not, um, very wildly. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the big things to keep in mind, some of the things to look for so that you can you know, prepare a quality application. And, and it's, it's both the application and the process, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen some communities that say, all right, we want a sealed bid opportunity application by a certain date. Hazel Park, for instance, closed mm -hmm. their applications on February 28th. Um, we've seen others that uh, are effectively first come, first serve. Yep. Um, we've seen, you know, others that are competitive markets where you're going to get a scoring system. And like Lansing. Yeah, like Lansing and, and a very, uh, I think, very detailed application. Um, similarly, we might find uh, other applications where it's somewhat wide open. You know, it's an unlimited license area. You do the, the things that the bells and whistles of the application require. And, yep. you know, it, it, the process isn't as challenging as, say, in uh, a competitive area. Yep. Some but, of the newer applications are basically saying go complete a step one with the state and then come back to us. So, you know, these, these are an evolving situation and every community is basically setting up what it wants completely separate from everyone else. Yeah, and I, and I think that one common thing that we see too is, is that as clients are approaching communities and, you know, or they hear one has opted in and maybe there's an application coming, there's some often an expectation that what we've seen in a different community might be exactly what we'll see here. Mm -hmm. And as you said uh, just a moment ago, I mean, the idea that you need a completed step one application um, is something that we're seeing in the newer ordinances and certainly not things that we saw in the past. So in other words, maybe the township is saying before we go through the process of vetting you ourselves, make sure you're eligible for a license with the state. Right. Um, and of course that adds time, uh, a lot of time, and it adds a lot of effort. Um, but how do you get your project in so that it's at least time stamped and ready for submission as soon as you clear that hurdle? So why don't we just um, take a step back again and talk generally about municipalities as a whole. And we've talked you know, in the past about locations, you know, townships, cities, and villages, what's the makeup of who the decision makers are? Right. So, you know, there's, every municipality is going to have the equivalent of a city council or a township board of trustees. They're basically the final line. They're the ones who pass ordinances and make all the important decisions for a community. Uh, you're also often going to be dealing with the equivalent of a planning commission. A planning commission's job is to evaluate different changes in use, different types of properties that are going to need permits and permissions and things. So in most cases, um, when you're doing a municipal application for a medical marijuana facility, uh, that process is going to put you before the planning commission. They're going to make a recommendation as to whether or not they think you should get that permission. And then that recommendation, whether you win or lose, is going to go before the board of trustees or the city council uh, for a final say. In theory, you can be recommended not to pass by the Planning Commission, and the City Council could let you pass anyway, um, or vice versa. You can be recommended by the Planning Commission, 
the board of trustees might say no for because it's ultimately their decision. So, you know, those are the two main public bodies that you'll be dealing with in most cases. Uh, but you also should keep in mind who the, the actual administrative teams in these municipalities are. You're going to be dealing potentially with a city manager or a township supervisor, uh, potentially a planning and zoning department or a zoning administrator. Some communities use a clerk to, to evaluate these applications. And, and those processes um, put responsibilities in different hands. There's no rules about how that community puts the decision-making process and the application handling process um, into place. It can be clerk in one community, zoning administrator in the next, manager in the next. I mean, So, you know, I think it's really important that we kind of point out, of course, at the onset, as you approach townships and if you're interested in pursuing a municipal application, we need to know the laywork, we need to know the groundwork within that community. And so um, this does go into an area where, um, you know, the team effort between ourselves, our clients, and, and those that are supporting the clients. We're, we're all working together to make sure that we have the right information and that we're working with the right application at the right time. And certainly also in terms of lobbying and familiarizing yourself with the community. Um, as the operators, this is the relationship that needs to be created. While we can do a lot of lobbying and create relationship for purposes of, you know, getting on agendas and moving forward, um, you know, the long-term relationship is really gaining their trust and knowing okay. who you are as operators. And so we recommend highly to communicate with these planning departments, set up the meeting before your submission, show them what you're doing, communicate. Right. They're just as important to your team as we would be. I mean, they live with you. If you get a license and you operate in their community, you're working with that community for the foreseeable future. So, you know, having them on your side, knowing what you need, knowing what they're worried about so you can address those concerns is going to go a long way, not only to getting a license, but to having a successful operation in general. So, Yeah, no doubt. And, and keeping it permitted year after year because, if, again, if they trust you and they know who you are and you're following through with the things you're saying you're going to do, both from the neighborhood, you know, compatibility as well as, um, you know, whatever community benefits programs, um, you know, honoring your word through this process over time in your operation will go a long way to maintaining that. And I just gave like two items that you'll see from an application and I use those words specifically, neighborhood compatibility plan, uh, mm -hmm. you know, community benefits programs, um, security plans, storage plans, inventory plans. Um, these are all items that we're going to find in different checklists for different reasons. But ultimately, as Travis was saying, you know, we got to understand the political process. Do we start with a special exception use hearing, SEU hearing? Mm -hmm. And then do we take that and go before a board after their, you know, recommendation for approval? Um, so making sure that every I is dotted and T is crossed and certainly having the complete application is key on that. Um, just comparing a few without really, you know, we mentioned Lansing because uh, if, if we're in the industry, uh, I think most have been aware that Lansing opened their process up you know, shortly before the state started accepting licenses. So basically the month of December, there was a crush of applications going there. I believe um, the deadline was December 15th, the first right. day you could submit an application. Yeah, and so in essence, Lansing was trying to say, if you're interested in having a, you know, a medical marijuana facility, in particular a dispensary, because those are truly limited in their community, they wanted people to get in early and get started, and then they'll right. review those packages as the state's reviewing the, the, the applications as well. Um, with outside of that, though, I don't really want to be too community specific today. Sure. What I want to do is just talk generally because there's certainly a few um, communities out there that are, there's a competitive market that might only be a couple of applications in, and we don't want to compromise any of our clients' confidentialities with that. Um, that being said, we do see a lot of commonalities. So let's discuss some common things before we get sure. into the particulars. Like, if I was to lay, you know, set up, like, what would be, you know, in addition to the application and identifying who you are, let's, let's talk about maybe two or three items that we've sure. seen in virtually every community. So a big one is going to be your security plan. They want to know um, how this facility is going to be safe for their community um, and how you're going to keep the sensitive items in, in that facility you know, safe. Um, so they're going to want to make sure you have alarms and cameras and locks and safes and uh, a security company that's monitoring it, uh, potentially other you know, security guards in some cases. Um, they want to know, you know if you have... Um, you know, if you're going to be a cash-based business, how are you going to keep that cash safe? If you're going to be storing a controlled substance, medical marijuana, how are you going to be storing it in a way where someone can't just kick in your window and rob your store? Let, let me let me kind of cut in there because sure. as we jump between the the security and now we're talking a little bit of storage, there's yeah, clearly, a, no, no, <laughs> but, but I think it, it makes a good point. 
there's a bridge. Sure. Security and storage are tied together. You know, the product that's in your store, how it's safe is your storage and how secure it is part of your security planning. So it's not just, hey, my camera points at the door. It's I know where the storage will be for this marijuana and how it's protected from, you know, anti-diversion measures and those kind of things. So, um, so I'll take it a step back as well. What we typically do is you typically have what, we, what I would call a business and operation plan. And that business and operation plan needs to list things like security, storage, uh, you know, waste disposal, uh, staffing plan, things like that. So, so while there are separate key items you need to hit, like a security portion, a security plan, or a waste disposal plan, or a storage plan, uh, they're not mutually exclusive, you know, obviously. So, you know, security is not only for the safety of your customers, the safety of your staff, the safety of your property, but it's also for, you know, how do you keep hazardous waste materials separate from consumable products? How that's do you right. keep chemicals stored in a way that's going to be safe? So, you know, and I think what's interesting, too, is, is that, and just, let's talk just the framework of the security itself. You mentioned door locks. I mean, there's certain levels of locks that, you know, you can uh, aspire to have that gives you greater security. And identifying those is key to your security plan. Mm -hmm. And I think what that does is it tells the community that you've gone to this step of saying, I don't just intend to have locks. I intend to have, intend to have these locks. Right. And, and whether you've purchased them yet or just made bids on them, it allows you to basically also determine what your cost and your budget will be for that right. portion of your security as well. And in addition to knowing how much everything's going to cost, if you're in a competitive situation and they require you to have locks, you want to highlight, we don't only have locks, we have the best locks we can have. We don't only have you know, the required cameras on our entrances and ent exits, we have cameras all over the place. I mean, if there's something about what you're doing... Uh, there's going to be factors that you need to display because they're required, and then there's going to be factors you can highlight and emphasize because it makes you look like a better applicant. Um, and this is where you do that. You lay this out. If you don't tell the community you have the best locks on the market, they're not going to know, and they're not going to use that to decide whether or not, you know. And I think that is also part of the due diligence of the operators. You know, we, we talk about, you know, a lot of times the, the – you know, if we're talking about a grower facility, for instance, and a grower licensee, or even a processor for that matter, they know their processor extraction equipment. They know the style they want to do. They know effectively the cost basis for that. Similarly, growers know the lights they want to use, mm -hmm. whether they're hydro, aero, or, you know, dirt, you know, whichever way they go. But the, the, the next step is the administration and function of the building beyond just growing the, the plant, you know, and understanding that, you know, where the cameras are located. So we can do within the planning, here's where the cameras are. And then the next step is, is these are the type of cameras that I've already begun to bid. Mm -hmm. These are the, you know, it's not, not only that I have the capital to say I can get my license, but I have the ability to pay for all the things that I'm looking to do with the facility. And then laying that out there so that you can increase that score and really showing that you are you got those I's dotted and T's crossed before you even have the permit. You know, right. In other words, you're doing that due diligence in advance. And even if you're in a situation where you don't need to have a competitive application, you still need to know these things. You're, you need, you're going to need to have a budget so that you can stick to it. You're going to need to know, okay, I can spend X amount on locks. Well, how do you know that? You figure out what the locks you want to use are and you see how much they cost and you count how many you need. I mean, that's all part of the, the business plan you would need anyway. Right. You need to know what your expenses are so that you can account for them and run this business successfully. So, you know, a lot of times you see all these requirements both at the local level and at the state. And there are very few requirements that aren't going to be just objectively important to you anyway. So it's important. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that that goes to the idea that, well, the municipality has an easy application process. We only have to turn in a few things. Well, you, you know, and I, the identifying the security plan, you want to make sure that what you're telling the city you intend to do or the municipality is the same as what we're filing either with the state or something similar. So, you know, again, it might be a smaller narrative that goes to the city, but the detail component is going to expound on that same narrative when we get to the state level. Um, and that way there's uh, continuity in the two applications and we're not finding ourselves in a position after approval that when you go back to the city to get your, you know, your CFO and build it out with your inspections, they're questioning, well, this isn't what you said you'd do. Right. And remember, you renew these every year. So if you say you're going to do something and you did something completely different, if you didn't inform them of that, you might have a problem when it comes for renewals, whether that's locally or with the state.
So you need to put the time in to lay a foundation for success. You might be in the easiest community in the world to have an application in, but that doesn't mean you should skip on the effort of putting quality materials together. No, I, I think that's very important because remember, year one, and, and it goes to what you're just saying, year one, we know they're asking, what will you do? Year two, they're going to say, show us what you did. Mm -hmm. And whether it's at a local or a state level, we know they're going to be asking, you know, show us that those anti-diversion measures that you told us about actually were done. Show us that those locks and those RFID tags for the employees and everything so we know where everybody is in the facility are actually operating and executing the way they're intended. Um, so we, we can look at, and that's just, you know, we spent seven minutes now talking just on security. You know, and there's, what, 15 items on every one of these well, packages. Listen, and here's something to keep in mind as well. You know, this is a new program both for the state and for the local communities that are going to be participating in the MMFLA. And if you're not developing a relationship with that municipality and something about the way the application was laid out needs to be changed to help you run your business successfully, well, guess what? If they don't like you because you've not been working with them well, they're probably unlikely to put that change through that's going to help your business be more profitable or more successful or safer or able to qualify at the state. So even though an ordinance says something now, that's, that's, not, that's a living document. They can change that in the future. They can make adjustments to it. They can make changes to it. Just like when we were talking in a previous video about how many licenses are allowed, they can always change those numbers. Well, they can also change what their application requirements are to make more sense when they know how this actually all works, when it's out there, when it's operating. So keeping those relationships, even after you get your approval, you're going to still need to work there. Your business is located in this community. Yeah. You're a part of this community now, and you know, you're going to need their help sometimes. Uh, there, there's no question about that. And again, that, that interaction at the municipal level is going to be key in, in whatever... You know, and this is one of those where the baton is actually shared. The water is shared between ourselves, our clients, and all the people and consultants involved in that, including the engineers. Um, another big one that comes up that is often an obstruction or an obstacle for people is the site plan. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in some communities, they require a site plan review. Other communities say we want to do a site plan only. Um, well, the, you know, the, there's a substantial difference in those two activities you know one requires an actual planning commission hearing on a review of your site plan mm -hmm. and in some communities it's actually done by the town board or the city council and so if you're making changes to the exterior of your building that could you know literally you might just be changing a door you might be changing you know maybe the pavement coming in on your driveway and stuff there the nuance of that and what's required township by township city by city is different Right. And so knowing exactly what you need in the municipality you intend to operate so that when you do your site plan and you need to have a review, that's filed too. Mm -hmm. If you don't need the review, you gave them what's needed so that they can make their decision um, on that first application. And, you know, having enough time in advance of, you know, filing it is important because it doesn't happen overnight. If you need a survey, you got to mm -hmm. hire the company, have them come out, take your time, end up with the report. You know, it's going to take several days. <laughs> and here's something I tell my clients all the time as well. You know, if you're in a community and they have a wonderful medical marijuana ordinance for the Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act, that doesn't mean it's the only ordinance they have. You're acquiring a building somehow and you're changing its use. Well, that's not a marijuana issue. That's a zoning issue. You're going to potentially have to go through some of these hearings completely objective from what you're trying to do there. If you're changing the use from what it was before to something new, which this is all new for everyone, there might be a, a site plan requirement just for that. You might also have a business license permit application for your medical marijuana, but that doesn't mean you don't necessarily have a, a site plan hearing before the planning commission or before the council or however that community sets it out. If you need to do some improvements to your building, like Craig said, they might need to be approved before you're able to go do them. And that might not have anything to do with your marijuana you know, project, right. but you, know, you still are in that community. And just like any other business in that community, any other landowner in that community, there might be procedures you have to go through. Yeah, there's no question that, you know, I would say in the 99 percentile, and I'm going to leave the percent one of <laughs> one of these communities is going to say, ah, ours is like completely independent of all of our other ordinances somehow. But, you know, the vast majority, the, the, the super majority of these are, you know, the widget is cannabis. Mm -hmm. the, the, the business is business. The city's operating. We, we take up as cannabis industry a percentage of their time, not all their time. Mm -hmm. And they're doing things and there's going to be somebody seeking to do tree removal on the same hearing day that you're looking to get your use permit and so you know it's important that we recognize this is city business we got to follow their rules um, 
So we talked site plan and security plan. We kind of delved into inventory planning, as you can see, that kind of mixes up in in the storage and everything with security. And, it, and it's that while they're different, you know, it could be one narrative package that covers those items. I mean, I think you were saying the package that was submitted yesterday was about 400 pages. When yeah, if that, that right. maybe. 500. Right. And so, and, and I had a USB that had tons of data on it in, in the township where I submitted mine yesterday for a client. And so, you know, the point being is, is that um, the form even is going to be different. How do they want to receive it? Is it a sealed package? You need to know these things. So when you walk in the door and you're right, it's time to write a check right. and submit it, that we have those bells and whistles known so that they're done correctly. Right. Didn't you have a pile this high that needed to uh, fit in a manila envelope yeah. or something? <laughs> so sometimes, you know, yeah, sometimes <laughs> yeah. those rules, you, you gotta, you know, I needed six copies of my 500 page application. So, you know, would send my clients off with a box. So. Yeah. And so, and again, that's, that's township by township. Yep. So a few other items that we, we can probably expect to see, I think, as these townships are, you know, considering what to do and some similarities, you know, employee training, mm -hmm. um, you know, oftentimes the, the township is wanting to know how many people do you plan to employ and you're thinking, well, I don't even have a permit yet. I don't know. I mean, no, they, they, we kind of have to have some semblance of that. We got to yeah. give them a, a, and it might change, you know, it might say we're, we tend to start with six full-time employees and hire people, you know, seasonally for the grow facility. Um, or alternatively, you know, we know we have, you know, eight people that are going to work full time in the provisioning center. Um, how are they trained? And mm -hmm. oftentimes the city and the township wants to know that you've maybe not, um, you know, not the specific program per se, but that you contemplate the type of program and the intent of the, of what you plan to do and that you can lay it out in an articulate way. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's another thing. What other things have you seen? Oh, they there's all kinds of things. Um, well, I, you know what, if I may just jump sure. in, because I see it at the bottom right there, a bond, insurance. Mm -hmm. um, that's, again, that that is available. There are companies available um, that can provide that. Um, certainly, you know, it's important that you know you need to have it. Yep. You need to file your application for it. You need to get in front of it. Um, our colleagues at Britain Mortar do a great job with that. But um, the point being is, is the bond is something that, you know, a lot of people say, well, what do I need it for? Why don't, it costs a, lot, a fair amount of money. It does. And sometimes you're required to list your municipality as an additionally insured, you know, portion of that insurance. So, you know, it, it some, I mean, the state doesn't make you do that. The state makes you have a certain amount for premise and casualty, you know, liability. But that doesn't mean the municipality might require something in addition to that. So, you know, being aware of what these requirements are, you know, some of them are going to take time. Some communities want to see how you're going to capitalize this business. And you might have to go through, just like you would for the state, and identify the assets you're going to be using to facilitate this. So, you know, that's not always a requirement. Sometimes they want to evaluate you financially just like the state does. They want to ensure this business that they allow in, especially if it's competitive and there's only going to be a few of them, is going to succeed. Because if, if there's only five allowed in your community, if you're going to be one of the five, they don't want you to shut your doors in five weeks. No, absolutely. Capitalization is important. And, mm -hmm. and, and being able to follow through with the items that you're seeking and stuff. So, again, we know, we, we know where the necessities are going to be, and some of those are going to take time. Um, you need you know, oftentimes a survey that demonstrates you know, how far away you are from um, a particular there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I love technology in here. Um, but, you know, a survey that says I'm not anywhere near a school or a church or whatever the buffer zone is in that particular community. Um, some communities just will do that work for you from their own zoning side. Mm -hmm. And I filed an application yesterday that required the, the operator to have provided the survey demonstrating they did the due diligence to show they're not within a buffer. Right. Um, and so that's another thing that I think takes time and should be prepared for in advance. We had a community uh, I was working on a few weeks ago that wanted to see maps to the closest the, the closest distance you were to churches and schools and we there were no churches or schools within three miles of the location we were pursuing and we we got it kicked back and it's like well, where are the maps and we're like well, i showed you where it's at in your town you, it's your town you know there's nothing here so we had to send in some maps it was fine we took care of it but you know if they say they want something you know if, you, if it's unclear ask them clarify with them do you do you need this in this situation i mean this is, and in most cases, this is the first time that municipalities looked at this application too. The people administering it didn't necessarily write it. So, you know, their interpretation of something in the ordinance or their application might be different from 
yours, if you were in those meetings where they wrote the ordinance, if you know if it was clear in those public hearings what that was designed for, doesn't always translate to how they're going to be implementing it. Oh, absolutely. In fact, you know, there's the township where the the whole seventy five twenty five for the capitalization they they read this to mean one hundred percent capitalization. Mm -hmm. So for their own permits, they're looking for a different number than the state had. And of course, we're trying to explain and educate them that that's actually an overburdensome way to approach this, but that that's their choice. Right. One thing I'll tell you that I think is very common too is is that the question why do they need it is should never be asked. Mm -hmm. Don't ask it. I mean, literally, if it's on their application and you're the one asking why they want it, you're wasting your time because they're likely not going to shift away from the request that they're making, and other people are going to be providing it. All right. And so it's just going to make your score less than theirs at that right. point. I know this is less about your application, but remember, this is a brand new ordinance. Just like they're unlikely to give you a variance for a spacing buffer, they're unlikely to make changes now. Well, they maybe make some changes or caveats you know, in year two and year three once they've gone through this process a few times. Maybe, maybe not, but in the first year, the first time they're accepting applications, um, it's unlikely they want to see anything different than what their community said they want in that application. No, no doubt about it. Um, what, and as we're winding down, uh, I, I think one last thing I would mention, too, is money. Um, it, oftentimes, it's $5,000 for the application itself, but don't think that's the extent of the money. They might have a sign permit. They might have a SE permit, permit, a site plan yeah. permit, um, a building permit, um, that business license Travis mentioned. Each of these items are going to cost you know, some amount of money in addition to the fee, and I think that... Um, you know, the idea that, you know, it's just going to be $5,000 because the application has said that. Remember, the, the business of the city is still in play. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't matter that your retail provisioning center is no different than a convenience store for that matter. And the same type of fees that the convenience store would have to pay in order to get itself its CFO and all the, you know, inspection costs and all that should be expected by the provision center in addition to the application fee. Um, and, and we got to point that out so that people are prepared as right. that application goes in. Um, and there's literally no continuity in that number across the state. Every community does it differently. They're looking to see how they can be revenue neutral in their review of these applications. Yep. And so I think that that's another important point. Um, you know, and Mike, we appreciate the comments. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, capitalization is what it is. Uh, while we might not like everything about the laws, um, we're going to live with what we have, and we're going to make recommendations on how it can be improved. Laura has listened. Mm -hmm. You know, going to the website at michigan.gov backslash medical marijuana, spelled with an H, of course. Um, you know, there's the opportunity to speak directly with Laura. There's email, yeah. phone numbers. Let them know your feelings on it, and be articulate, and... Yeah. And, and provide that and similarly with the communities interact yeah and here's here's something i'd say when you're reaching out to laura i mean it's one thing to not like something it's another to provide them reasons to back up why you feel that's the case this is new for them too if you i mean when when patients when the industry is explained to them why something doesn't make sense and they were persuasive with the facts and evidence they were citing it worked Yes. When, when someone just yells at them, it didn't work. So I'm not saying that's what you're doing here, Mike, but, um, you know, what is the issue? Why is it an issue? If you can articulate why, explain that to Laura, they're likely to at least consider it. Yeah, and, and I think, um, you know, and again, just, uh, just be communicative with the people you're going to be doing business with. These are not our adversaries. These are not people that we are trying to, you know, get into a business with without being completely transparent. Mm -hmm. And the more transparent we can be in this application process, the more opportunity that we can actually go with, you know, that application maybe a week or two in advance, meet the persons that will be reviewing it from the planning side. And again, we kind of circle back to that advice in this conversation now so that there's time. Mm -hmm. While we're going to get these done by deadlines when required, Having that time to build your application and do it correctly and talk to the community and kind of work your way into that process um, is a big part of it. And, you know, making the appointments with the planners and doing it that way. Time is key. I mean, you're putting this application together. The requirements of that application are things about what your business is going to do and how it's going to do it. So if you put more time and thought into those answers, it's your business. Your business is going to 
run better. It's going to be more successful. So if you give yourself a tight deadline to just check those boxes so that you can get it in because you gave yourself a week, can you do that? Sure, but it's not as likely to be the best security plan for your business. It's not likely to be the best business and operations plan for your business. I mean, it could be, but, but what you're telling the community you're going to do is how they're deciding whether or not they're going to say, yes, we want these guys. So if you take the time to do it right, you're much more likely to be successful. Well, I, I think we covered a lot with the municipalities, and hopefully we gave some good advice for people to follow as they consider um, where they're going to do business here in Michigan. As we know, there's a, you know, a significant number of communities that haven't come online. Just this past week, I think our update had you know, a number more have opted in. Mm -hmm. um, but even that number is relatively small compared to the amount of communities around the state. And so, um, you know, it's important that we keep in communicating. If you're looking to work in a community and you're looking to get on presentations, you know, bring in experts. Don't just be the only people in the room. We can bring a lot to the table. We're talking about how you operate, how law works, marrying the two together. Um, we've now done 40 episodes. Uh, you can catch us all on YouTube. Um, each one's about a half hour, so we're, we're happy and proud to provide about 20 hours of content now. Um, a lot of information, there's been a lot of evolution. Continue to follow us, ask us questions, as we said, offline. We'll get back to you with those. Um, our job here is to be a resource to the community mm -hmm. and do our best to get other people operating, licensed, and compliantly and enjoying the fruits of their effort here in Michigan. So we'll look forward to talking to you next week. Um, for Craig Aronoff and Travis Copenhagen. Thank you very much from Canvas Leaker. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, guys.